I've just seen the live action Netflix remake of Cowboy Bebop. And why? You see, anime is a very special thing to me. I love anime. Some of my favorite shows of all time are animes. And especially during this hellscape pandemic, I found myself watching more anime than live action shows for the first time in my life. And one of the first ever anime that I ever watched that really turned me on to the whole genre as a whole was Cowboy Bebop. Before watching Cowboy Bebop, I think I had seen some episodes of Naruto or Dragon Ball Z on cable, and I'd really lumped them in together with Western cartoons in my brain. My view at that point in my life was that anime was a lot like kids' cartoons, and that I had outgrown them, just like I had shows like Spongebob, and that live action was more mature and therefore superior. Of course, nowadays, I really don't care about that, and I would actually rather watch Spongebob than most shows, but this is the viewpoint that I held as a teenager. But then one day, I heard about this show called Cowboy Bebop. I forget exactly how I started watching it, um, or who told me to watch it, but I ended up downloading the first episode on a sketchy pirating site and watching it in the darkness of my bedroom. And this show immediately blew away any expectations I had for what anime was. It was dark, it was mature, it was funny. It was everything that I really could have wanted at that point in my life from a show. And I immediately binged the entire thing in one sitting. I fell in love with it and both anime as a whole at that point in my life, and I've been watching anime ever since. So when I heard that they were making a Netflix original Cowboy Bebop live action show, my first thought was that it was gonna be awful. And why is it that I thought that? Why is it that when I was told that there was going to be a new version of one of my favorite shows of all time, I immediately expected it to be bad? Well, there have been many attempts to make live action anime shows, and there have been many, many failures. In fact, nearly every attempt that most people can think of of a live action adaptation of an anime show is awful. And there are only a select few of them that people even consider to be watchable. In fact, if you look up a list of the top ever live action anime adaptations, there are so few good ones that some of the lists will include Old Boy, which isn't even an anime adaptation. Technically, Old Boy had no anime and the source material was only a manga. Still, anime is usually just manga in motion anyway. Technically, Avengers vs. X-Men and XXX parody isn't an MCU film, but they're both movies based on comic books, so it counts. And now there are two main reasons to me why anime adaptations never work. The first is, well, they're an adaptation. A lot of the times, the purpose of an adaptation, sadly, is to make money. Since studios know that they can make a shitty movie or a cheap product and slap on a recognizable name, and they'll be able to turn a profit. So lots of anime adaptations turn out to be really, really cheap, or made by people who have never even heard of the original. Or both, in the case of Dragon Ball Evolution. The second big reason is that anime can be incredibly weird. Even in the animated format, a lot of shows are very weird, very eccentric, and very, very campy. So to convert that eccentricity out of the animated format is sometimes borderline impossible without turning it into an accidental comedy. Again, like Dragon Ball Evolution. And this second reason is the main reason that anyone will give as to why anime doesn't work in live action. Like, how would you even make some of these shows that are out today into a live action Netflix show? How do you show a fight scene in One Punch Man without looking ridiculous? Are you going to get a real 17 year old girl to play the main character in a show about girls losing their clothes to become more powerful? Will you use real cum on Shinji's hand in the scene where he masturbates over the body of his unconscious underage female friend? These are the questions that will hopefully never be answered. 
These shows are entirely written, directed, and voice acted around being animated. And they have quirks that stem from both the animated format and the Japanese culture from which the creators are based. Characters can move inhumanly fast. There are long pauses in which we hear characters' inner monologues. 15-year-old girls are treated like they're 18, and 1,000-year-old girls look like they're 8. It's weird. And that's almost why I like it. Except for that last part, because I'm not a pedophile. To make most any mainstream anime live action, you would have to remove a lot of the quirks that only work in the animated format. But to remove those quirks would also remove a lot of the charm of the show. So either way, you're going to get something that's less than the original. Especially if you do what Dragon Ball Evolution did. Human power has failed before. God, I could play clips from that movie all day. And I will. Here's one more. Dragon! So most anime is weird, and really can't be translated because of a lot of the quirks of the format from which it comes. But what about Cowboy Bebop specifically? I did say earlier that it was incredibly mature, and it's a very subdued and grounded show that seems like it would work in live action. And honestly, I would consider Cowboy Bebop to be what I would call a close to anime- fucking this shit. And honestly, I would consider Cowboy Bebop what I would call a close to reality anime, something that's seemingly based on reality instead of a completely fictional universe. The fact that it's animated still plays a large part in the show, which is why it is animated in the first place, but a lot of the time when you're watching it, you can imagine it being live action very easily. More examples of close to reality anime are things like Death Note or Ghost in the Shell, Steins Gate, to name a few. And something that you'll notice about all of those shows is that they all have live action adaptations already. Well, I mean, Steins Gate actually technically has a stage play somehow. <laughs> But according to a top 10 article, that counts. And something else to mention is that the live action adaptations of all of the shows that I've mentioned are terrible. Well, except Science Gate. The live action play for that actually looks really good, surprisingly, but the other two are awful. <laughs> And this seems confusing because there's not a lot of quote-unquote anime bullshit in those shows. Well, except for Ryuk, but um, he's the best part of that movie. Good. Now as long as we're playing, let's do it right. There's no need to stop it. Who? I'm sorry, what else is there? How? I stand by the fact that Willem Dafoe can do no wrong because even when he phones in a performance, it's just the Green Goblin. <laughs> So what makes these movies, and now Cowboy Bebop, so bad exactly? Well, to explain further, I actually want to break down this show and try to explain the exact difference between the Netflix show and the original, because I think it will really highlight the problem I have with Cowboy Bebop as well as the other live-action adaptations like Ghost in the Shell and Death Note 2. And luckily for me, a lot of the problems that I have with this show rear their ugly head in the very first episode. Except for one, but I... I really don't want to talk about that. So I am going to break down the original first episode of the Cowboy Bebop anime, and then I am going to break down the first episode of the Netflix show and show you exactly what I think the remake missed. Because I think watching these two first episodes back to back will show you exactly what's wrong here. So let's get into it. It's complicated to be an outlaw nowadays. <laughs> The first episode of the anime, titled Asteroid Blues, begins with our main character, Spike Spiegel, smoking in the rain. He drops a rose in a puddle as he walks away, and we see intercut flashbacks of Spike shooting people and smiling as blood drips down his face. 
We then get our episode opening, and I can't play much of it, but the opening theme to Cowboy Bebop is one of, if not the most energizing openings of all time. You can be in an existential depression and this opener will make you want to go out and commit space crime. We then get some classic western guitar playing over shots of a space station and ships flying around, setting the space western tone of the show. It's a pretty average day for the main characters as Spike is practicing his martial arts and his ship maiden partner, Jet Black, is cooking dinner. They're both bounty hunters who in this world are referred to as cowboys, and the ship they're on is called the Bebop, thus giving context to the name of the show. Jet talks about a bounty on a man called Asimov, a former member of a syndicate who is on the run somewhere on the asteroid called Tijuana. We get a funny aside where Spike is upset there's no beef in the so-called bell peppers and beef that Jet cooked. There's no beef in here. So you wouldn't really call it bell peppers and beef, now would you? Jet responds to this by scolding Spike for costing them money on their previous jobs. It's here that we're organically introduced to the fact that the two are dead broke, and also that Spike is incredibly reckless. The Bebop then goes through an astral gate, something that lets you fly at hyperspeed, similar to the mass relays in Mass Effect, and Spike takes out his personal spacecraft to go see someone. Somewhere else on Tijuana, we see a dive bar with three old men playing cards. A mysterious couple enters the bar, and we can see the woman is pregnant. The man flashes a vial of some red liquid at the bartender, who leads him to the back. The bartender asks for proof that the red vial is indeed red eye, a performance enhancing drug, so Asimov uses it, spraying the liquid directly into his eye. We then suddenly see the bar get completely shot up by a group of gunmen, and we look through Asimov's red tinted point of view as he easily dodges bullets and murders the gunmen under the effects of the drug. Cutting back to Spike, we see him talking to an old Native American man named Laughing Bull. Bull says that there is a woman who will lead to death in the future. But Spike dismisses this and says that he's already died due to a woman. We then see Jet arrive to the destroyed bar that Asimov was at, as he gets the jump on two gunmen who come in after him, knocking one out and questioning the other. Meanwhile, Spike is starving for food as his ship is starving for fuel. He lands and goes to a public bathroom where we see Asimov come in to clean up. The two have a tense moment before Spike nonchalantly tells him to not clog the drain as he leaves. On his way back to his ship, Spike bumps into the pregnant woman, whose name is Katarina, and ends up eating some of the food from a grocery bag that spilled on the floor, which she finds charming. The two begin talking about Spike's ship, how he was born on Mars, and Katarina says she wants to go there someday. The conversation turns serious as Spike reveals that he's a bounty hunter, and Asimov sneaks up behind him and starts to strangle him. Katarina pleads with Asimov to let Spike leave, and the couple hastily take off in their ship. Asimov then scolds the woman for liking Spike. Jet then walks up on Spike and says that he can't find Asimov. He talks about how Asimov stole Red Eye from the Syndicate, but it's too difficult to track him. Spike happily reveals that he just encountered Asimov and actually managed to steal a vial of Red Eye off of him, and he knows they'll be at the North Gate since Laughing Bull mentioned something about it in their earlier conversation. We then see the couple heading to a restaurant so Asimov can do another drug deal, but the person he's dealing with is revealed to be just Spike in a cartoonishly large sombrero. Spike starts fighting Asimov, and though Asimov is still partially under the influence of Red Eye, Spike reveals himself as an amazing hand-to-hand -hand fighter, able to keep up with Asimov for some time before Syndicate gunmen show up. The gunmen begin shooting at everyone, and a stray bullet even goes through Katarina's pregnant stomach, which is revealed to be full of red-eye vials. The couple manage to escape the gunfire and fly away in their craft, which Spike follows in his own. Somber music begins to play as Asimov keeps loading up on red-eye, while the pregnant woman protests, saying it'll kill him. The music starts to crescendo as Katarina laments to Spike that she'll never see Mars, as Asimov is flying directly at a heavily guarded gate. Spike suddenly realizes that Katarina has shot Asimov, and a moment of silence breaks as Katarina looks directly at Spike flying next to her. She simply says, Adios. And Katarina, as well as the ship she's in, are eviscerated by bullets. We see the blackness of space dotted with the red vials in Katarina's belly floating away, before finally cutting back to the Bebop. We see Spike once again training his martial arts, and he stares off into space as Jed announces that he's made dinner again. The Bebop flies out into the dark, and the episode ends. And now this episode is an amazing first episode. It's a well-written standalone story that hints at the background elements and plot lines of the main characters while also just being a self-contained narrative that kind of shows a day in the life of Spike and Jet. So let's see how this first episode of the anime compares with the first episode of the live action. You good guys. Or bad guys. Depends on who you ask.
Now, something important to mention is that the standard length of an episode for the Cowboy Bebop anime is 24 minutes, as most anime shows are, whereas the Cowboy Bebop Netflix show is 50 minutes an episode. This means that there's a lot more going on in the first episode of the Netflix show, as we're introduced to characters earlier, we're moved forward in the main plotline a lot faster, but I think it's still comparable to the first episode of the anime because, in total, the episode is still the same plotline. The first episode of the live-action remake, titled Cowboy Gospel, opens on a bloodbath at a casino. A group of gunslingers led by a man named Tanaka are pulling off a heist and have killed most of the people inside, keeping the others as hostages. Tanaka is ranting about corporations and how much he hates them, which, I mean, hey, same, and Spike shows up on the elevator to the casino. Spike opens up with a cool one-liner and begins fighting and kicking the asses of the gunslingers, as Jet shows up a moment later to help him. The two begin killing the gunslingers one by one, even even though Jet chastises Spike because they need the whole gang alive for their bounty. And at the end of the fight, one of the gunslingers ends up firing a disruptor gun, which ends up blowing a hole out of the side of the space station casino. Starting to get sucked out of the ship, Jet manages to push the button to seal off the hole just as Spike and Tanaka are about to fly out. The two get up alright, and Tanaka is knocked out, leading to our intro. And I think it has something to do with the mixing. I'm not an audio engineer, so I'm not entirely sure, but something just feels off about this version of Tank. And they do change the intro in a lot of the episodes, which I definitely wasn't a huge fan of. I found myself actually sacrilegiously pressing the skip intro button a couple of times. After the intro, we see Spike having dreams of a blonde woman with a rose tattoo intercut with a violent shootout. Spike frantically wakes up, and we see him aboard the Bebop as it pulls out of a spaceport and flies through an astral gate. It's now here that the episode gets to the point where the original begins. And now, some might disagree with me here, but I don't think the intro is entirely necessary. It is an attempt to give more to do, and to give more of a action-y opening to these main characters as they're being introduced, but I think I like the original's intro more because it just shows them going about their day. We don't learn that Spike is this amazing fighter until we actually see him fight later in the episode. We don't open seeing this duo as like action superheroes. We show them just as normal people and then later it's revealed that these guys are very capable. Something else to mention is that, as you've probably seen with the clips I've already shown as I'm talking about the intro, the show looks weird. I'm hesitant to call it cheap necessarily, because there's obviously a lot of effort going on with the sets and costumes and CG, but I think that's the problem. You can tell that every single location is a set, and the characters are wearing costumes more than they're wearing actual clothing, so it comes across as people in cosplay walking around recreations of the show's locations. They are very good recreations, but recreations nonetheless. But anyway, back to the show. The plot here follows the original quite closely at this point, so I'll just speed through it. Spike and Jet talk about needing money and how their bounties aren't working out. We then cut to Asimov and Katarina going into the bar. Asimov tries to sell Red Eye to the bartender, but Syndicate members show up and start shooting up the place. Asimov, on Red Eye, then murders the Syndicate members, which is kind of funny to me because in the original there's this great like POV, artistic, almost silent shot as he kills all these people, but here we just get a GoPro strapped to the actor's face. Jet then arrives at a police station, which is different from the original, and redeems the bounty on Tanaka. It's less than they wanted because Tanaka's the only member they brought alive, and Jet then talks to a cop friend of his who tells him about his new bounty. We then see Spike practicing his martial arts. Jet tells him about the bounty on Asimov, but Spike doesn't want to do it, and Jet says they need the money, so the two land down on Tijuana to look for him. We see Spike walking around asking if anyone's seen the couple, to which everyone says no. Meanwhile, Jet is talking to the bartender, who says a purple-haired girl was also looking for the couple. Spike is then led to the outside of a hospital, where inside, Asimov is making a hospital worker heal him at gunpoint. Katarina is waiting outside, and Spike ends up charming her as the two talk about Mars and how Katarina wants to go there. However, in the biggest difference from the original, a purple-haired woman holds Spike at gunpoint, asking him to back off of Katarina, who is the woman's target. This woman is Faye Valentine, of course, who we have not met in the original show yet. Faye says Katarina is the daughter of a wealthy man who wants her back, and Spike begins to fight Faye over the girl, letting the girl escape and drive away with Asimov. Back at the Bebop, Spike brings Faye aboard in handcuffs. She's rude and snarky, but in a considerably less fun way than I remember the original Faye being. Jet Black, meet Faye Valentine. Hey, fuck you! 
Spike and Jet talk about the newfound bounty on the girl, but Spike doesn't want to do it because the girl is involved with the syndicate. Jet once again brings up that they need the money, which is enough to convince him. Spike then takes out his small personal aircraft as Jet goes out on motorcycle, both to look for the couple. Meanwhile, Faye breaks out of the Bebop's bathroom. We see Asimov and the girl are at a small airport and are about to hijack a ship when Spike and Jet ambush them. Spike offers to let the girl get away if the guy gives himself in, but Asimov says no and drugs up to fight the duo. The syndicate even show up in the middle of the sprawl and begin to shoot up the place, where a stray bullet pierces Katarina's stomach and spills vials of red eye all over the place. Spike begins to take out Syndicate members one by one as Jet continues fighting Asimov. Asimov is actually about to strangle Jet to death when Faye shows up and shoots him in the neck. Meanwhile, one of the Syndicate members seems to recognize Spike and says that he should be dead, to which Spike agrees and kills the man. Asimov and Katarina just barely make it to the aircraft and begin to take off, and we see them heading straight for the north gate which is heavily guarded. Just before they get there, Asimov ends up bleeding to death in the passenger seat. Spike ends up catching up to Katarina and begs her to take herself in, as the gate police are threatening to fire on her. Katarina just says that she needs to wake up, a callback to what Spike said to her at the hospital about his former love, and continues flying forward before getting gunned down. It's time to wake up. The episode doesn't end here though, as we cut to a syndicate member who survived the airport shootout, walking up to a white-haired man who appears to be the leader of the syndicate. The white-haired man is angered that they couldn't stop the bounty hunters, and when the member brings up someone they call Fearless, the white-haired man cuts him down with a katana. The white-haired man then goes to visit a blonde woman who has a rose tattoo just like the girl in Spike's dreams. And the episode ends. So we've now covered the first episode of both the anime and the live action remake of Cowboy Bebop, and hopefully you've probably already noticed what's different about them. But just because I like hearing my own voice, I'm going to explain in detail all of the problems that I have with the remake. First of all, we have the entire look of the show. Like I mentioned earlier, the sets and costumes are all well made, but they are all very obviously sets and costumes. And all in all, it just looks really fake. My dog! On top of that, the cinematography specifically, I found adds a lot to the cheapness. I know a lot of people have complained online about the excessive use of Dutch angles in this show where they just tilt the camera for seemingly no reason. And specifically for me, I found a lot of problems with the excessive use of center framing in the show where the actor is alone in the middle of the screen with a lot of space around them on either side, sort of like how I film my videos. And while I think it works for a YouTube video, it doesn't really work for me in a Netflix show and kind of adds to that low budget feeling. Moving on, we have the casting and acting in this show. And I'm just gonna go out and say it, John Cho is not Spike Spiegel to me. I just never felt that he embodied the character that well. He comes across as a cool enough guy and it is fun to watch him on screen, but I just never really got the goofiness or energy that Spike had. And I don't think there's anything that really shows the difference in these versions of Spike better than the action in the show. Spike in the anime is goofing around, he's light on his toes, he's bouncing around and doing all of these elaborate moves because he's an incredible fighter but he's also really not taking a lot of it seriously. John Cho just kind of stands there and does choreography. But moving on to the other cast members, I think that pretty much everyone else in the show is just adequately cast. I don't have a bone to pick with a lot of the other characters in the show like I do with Spike, which is mostly just because Spike is an important character to me, he was my favorite watching the show and I kind of grew up with him. But honestly the best performance in the show to me is Mustafa Shakir as Jet. He just is Jet. So much so in fact that I hadn't seen the original in some time and when I went and watched the Netflix version I watched the original after to compare. and. I completely forgot that Jet wasn't explicitly black in the original, though the Netflix version seems to not forget about Jet's race. Dinner. Me, you, bottle of Chianti. Two bottles if we're feeling dangerous. Sounds to me like blackmail. Damn right it is, because Jet, you are black and you are male. 
That's pretty cringe. And everyone else in the show is just mediocre and they don't really feel that much like the characters. And Vicious to me feels the most like a different person completely, both in the fact that his character is different and also that they expand on his storyline way more in the Netflix version. But I'm just not intimidated by someone who looks like Farquaad. And I feel like there was someone I was going to talk about, but I just forgot. Some main cast member that they did in the Netflix version that I just forgot talk about. That's pretty cringe. And between all of the problems that I have just mentioned, they all start to add up to one big problem that is the main problem I have with the show. And it's the same problem that Ghost in the Shell, Death Note, and most of the live action adaptations of anime have in common. And that problem is that they completely missed the tone and point of the original show. And now I've talked about tone in my previous videos, and I just want to clarify it somewhat in case you don't know exactly what I'm talking about, because I feel like I bring it up a lot and it could be some sort of nebulous term that you think I'm using. Tone to me, and the definition of tone in movies, is the feeling you get when you're watching a movie or show. It is the atmosphere it has, it is the emotion that it's trying to get you to feel when you're watching it, and overall, tone is very important to something because it helps with the consistency of the point of what you're making. For example, if you make a comedy show but you make it undersaturated and overly sad music is added to it, it will no longer be that good of a comedy. And Cowboy Bebop, the original, is distinctly noir. It is very serious, very subdued, very grounded, and somber a lot of the time. The show has a lot of fun, and the characters can be quirky, but the overall tone is still very serious a lot of the time. Cowboy Bebop the Netflix show feels like a Saturday morning cartoon. Because instead of a dark and serious tone with fun moments laid on top, we get a fun and bright tone with dark and edgy moments laid on top. Which is funny because even in one of the episodes they do a full on detective noir homage and it just feels like one of the parody episodes in Community. Getting Udai to name the actor could get messy. Sure, but maybe it goes down easy. I transferred or downloaded Todd's photograph to this computer and as you'll see with a few adjustments I can make the entire image Old West color. I don't know, I thought it was cool. The original Cowboy Bebop is also a western. And I didn't see nearly that much Western influence in the Netflix remake. The world doesn't feel nearly as lived in and grungy in the remake when everything is manufactured sets. And the guitar chords that used to set the tone of each episode just feel more plastered on. Which is to be expected since as we all know there are no live action space westerns out there. Like a show that was directly inspired or influenced by Cowboy Bebop, you know, like some sort of beloved live action interpretation of the original that, that nails the tone and characters and writing. <sighs> if only. And this change and this problem that I have with the tone is exactly what makes me not like the remake. Because all of the problems that I've had with the show about casting and cinematography and writing are all in service of this change in tone. Now, if they nailed the tone of this show, the sort of dark noir elements, the western feeling, and the subdued tragic emotions that you get with the main plotline, then I think myself and a lot of the fans would be a lot more lenient on the remake. I myself would be a lot more willing to forgive a lot of the smaller elements like casting being off if the tone was more in line with the original. And this is the same problem that Ghost in the Shell and Death Note and all of the other bad live action adaptations also have. Because if you're making a Cowboy Bebop show that removes all of the noir and darker western tones and influences, but you still keep the same general plot of the show, sometimes shot for shot, then you're just making an inferior version of the original. And I do just want to say that I don't hate Cowboy Bebop. I don't hate the Netflix show. It's not terrible. 
I am just ripping it on the premise of being a Cowboy Bebop show. Because the entire time I was watching this show, I kept noticing that every once in a while I was having a lot of fun with it, and I kept wondering to myself why when I didn't like what they were doing to the original. And then I realized that all of the parts of the show that I liked and enjoyed were the parts that didn't remind me of Cowboy Bebop. I was literally having the most fun with this show when I forgot that it was supposed to be a Cowboy Bebop remake. Because as a campy sci-fi show with quirky bounty hunters, the Netflix show is pretty good. But they really needed to make it an original IP with an original story for that to work. Because I'd honestly love it if that was the case, if it was an original space western show. Because I love space westerns in general. Because I'd be watching the show going, hey that reminds me of Cowboy Bebop, instead of, hey this makes me want to go watch Cowboy Bebop. So, the Cowboy Bebop Netflix show isn't great. But, does this prove that live action adaptations of anime never work? Well, I don't think that it does. That's right, motherfucker, I clickbaited you. The title of the video is a lie, and you can't stop me. What are you gonna do, dislike it? They don't even show up anymore. <laughs> that was a good one. That was a good laugh. That was a good fake evil laugh. Now, there are a couple of examples that people bring up when talking about good anime live action adaptations. I mean, Alita Battle Angel didn't get terrible reviews. The Japanese Death Note looks kind of alright, even though Ryuk looks like a PS3 character. The JoJo live action is just as fucking weird as the original. Wait, no, that's the wrong clip. Uh, this one should make more sense. Get on! Get on the <laughs> but most of the live action adaptations that people bring up really aren't that great of examples since a lot of them tend to have the same problems that I've mentioned, just on a much smaller scale. They'll still have weird tone issues or look cheap or weird sometimes, but they're more fun I think and so we're able to forgive them a lot easier. But no, I want to give a golden example of an anime movie that works. An anime movie so good that it redefined action as we know it. And one that wasn't even a direct anime adaptation. That's right everyone, I'm talking about Man of Steel. One of the final battle sequences in Zack Snyder's Man of Steel is believed to be influenced by fight scenes featured in the wildly popular Dragon Ball Z. Master the second level of air bending. You have to control two things at once. <laughs> Knock this orange from my hand. But no, I'm obviously talking about The Matrix. The Matrix is a live action anime. You cannot convince me otherwise. It is an indisputable fact. Because if you told me about a movie where a man cuts a car in half with a fucking katana while he's inside a computer simulation, I'd ask you where on Crunchyroll I can find it. And you have The Matrix, Pacific Rim, Scott Pilgrim, Firefly, Looper. There are tons of movies that are inspired by anime and feel like anime when you watch them. Because if you told me any of those movies were adaptations of an anime, I would believe you without question. But hey, that's cheating, right? Obviously this whole video is about adaptations, so an original work that just feels like anime shouldn't count. Well even if you don't consider these movies as live action anime adaptations, they can still teach us a whole lot about how to make a good one. So for any aspiring filmmakers watching this, which is very unlikely because these usually get about 10 views, but still, here are three tips on how to make a good live action anime adaptation. Tip number one. Don't do it. If you can, don't make a direct adaptation, because direct adaptations are very difficult, because you have to be entirely faithful to the original while still justifying yourself as to why you're making a new version of it. This to me is why video game movies often suffer a lot of the same problems that anime adaptations do. But if you are forced by executives to make an adaptation, the best option in my opinion is to make a new story. 
I think a good example of this, though a comic book adaptation instead of an anime, is the Watchmen television show. It had a completely new cast and was completely different and separate from the original because the creator had a story that he wanted to tell in the universe. And it could capitalize on the Watchmen name, so win-win. And how cool would it have been if the live action show was original stories in the Cowboy Bebop universe? But when it's just the same plot lines rearranged and gutted into a new one, it just makes me want to watch the original again. Because it's better. Tip number two, pick a good show. Now, this doesn't apply to you if you aren't a hack Netflix producer, but let's face it, those are the only people making live action anime adaptations right now. So to them, pick an anime that works as live action. Pick something grounded, something that can actually work in a live action space, and make damn well sure that there is a reason to make it live action. Some reason that it would work better with real people in the roles as opposed to animated characters. Or some story that you want to tell that the original didn't. To me, a good pick for a live action anime adaptation would be Psychopaths, because it would just be a futuristic detective show. But again, remaking Psychopath Season 1 without changing anything from the original would just be pointless. Tip number three, be passionate. Because in order to adapt something, you really need to be passionate and you need to understand what exactly makes the anime good. You need to understand the themes, the point, the tone of the show, and know exactly how you're going to replicate them. And this is by far the most important one, because if there is a good director with a good vision of the show they want to make, I think they can turn even the weirdest, most eccentric anime into a good live-action adaptation. I mean, just look at how Denis Villeneuve turned Dune, a formerly considered unadaptable work, into a good sci-fi movie. And there you go, advice on how to make a live-action anime adaptation from a YouTuber with 80 subscribers, because I'm an expert, obviously. So, what can we take from all of this? What can we learn? Well, I think there's one important lesson that we can take from all of this, and that's that Dragon Ball Evolution is free to watch on YouTube. Go watch that now. Why are you still here? But, before you do, I would really appreciate it if you gave this video a like since you've already made it this far, and also subscribe if you want to see more videos like this one. And of course, comment down below. Netflix, this video is fair use, and if you copyright claim me, I swear to god I will rain hellfire down upon you the likes of which has never been seen. I'll see you next time.